Do you find that there are times when the words of Scripture seem to jump right off the page and speak directly to you and to your life situation? Hopefully somewhere in that box of uh, nine boxes of sermons, something on there might have jumped out and spoken to you in some way. Well, this story from Matthew about Peter walking on the water toward Jesus, I think should resonate in our minds this morning. Has your life been just a little bit stormy lately? Have you had just about enough of being buffeted by waves? Do you feel yourself maybe sinking just a little bit as we come together for worship this morning? These are, these are challenging times. People are dissatisfied with the direction this nation seems to be heading. A poll has said that over 80% of respondents think that Congress is doing a terrible job right now. doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, Congress is doing a lousy job and people are unhappy and uneasy. That's what the poll says. We're folks who are most content when we have some idea of what the future is going to look like, what the future is going to bring. We like that feeling of security. And now we find that that security is shaken as those institutions that we have learned to put our trust in don't seem to be functioning in a way that would give us that kind of confidence. In other words, the seas out there are rough. And the waves are crashing. So, how are you doing with that? What is your frame of mind? Some of you have said that you haven't been sleeping very well lately. So if you doze off during the church service this morning, I can understand that. But I would advise you to hang in there with me for just a few moments as we see what God might be telling us in these stormy times in this passage from Matthew. It's probably a familiar story, this story of Jesus walking on the water. As I said, the text continues from the reading from last Sunday that Jesus had just used a few loaves and fish that his disciples had offered up, and he fed over 5,000 folks. And as you can imagine, the crowd must have been pretty excited about what Jesus had done with the loaves and fish. It's interesting, Matthew should write that Jesus immediately got his disciples out of there and put them on a boat, and he stayed behind to dismiss the crowds. He said, I'll meet you on the other side. And then he took some time to reflect and to pray. And in the meantime, a storm comes up and the disciples in the boat have a terrible night. But I think this is probably why Jesus included fishermen in his first band of followers. Because they knew how to handle themselves in high water, in rough water, on stormy seas. It's interesting that there's no mention of the disciples being afraid at all during the storm. Scripture doesn't say anything about that. They don't cry out in fear until they see a ghostly figure walking on the water toward them. Matthew writes, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And then they cried out in fear. And what was Jesus' response? He says, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And that's the heart of the story right there. One Bible scholar said that those words should be written over the doorway to every church in the world. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. When Jesus calls us to be courageous, and when Jesus calls us and commands us not to be afraid, both of those phrases, both of those statements are centered on the statement, it is I. That's the focus. In other words, or another way to translate that phrase, it is I, is I am. And where have you heard that before? Remember in the Old Testament when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and called him to go to Egypt to speak for God, to release the slaves of the Hebrews, the Hebrew slaves from the, from the uh, rule of Pharaoh. Moses asked God, Who shall I say has sent me? And God answers, Tell them, I am has sent you. The courage of the disciples and their ability to face life unafraid is rooted in knowing that God is present in Jesus Christ with them. Take heart, I am. Do not be afraid. 
Now, when it comes to facing storms in our lives, then suddenly the meaning of the story becomes crystal clear, doesn't it? We look at Peter, who is eager to prove what a good disciple he is, and we see him stepping out of the boat to walk over the water to Jesus. We know all about Peter. We've read about Peter before. And so we shake our heads and we kind of chuckle and take note that this is just about what we would expect Peter to do. He's sort of an every man's disciple. He's been blessed with all of our common good points. He's been cursed with all of our weaknesses, all in one convenient passage. He's a great teaching tool for us. So, so Peter bravely responds to Jesus' invitation to join him on the waves. He steps out and he makes some good progress. He's staying above the storm. And then he takes his eyes off Jesus. He gets caught up in the turmoil all around him, the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. And so if you're looking for a message for the passage, it's pretty simple. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Focus on the Lord. The worse your troubles, the more you need to look to Jesus for help, to save you. Don't let the wind and the waves and the storms get the best of you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's almost like a drumbeat. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And it's not a bad message. As ministers like to say, it'll preach. <laughs> it, it's good advice. A call to faith that is alive and that shows a strong trust in Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. We all need to be told that we should do a better job in that area because we all could, right? And that's exactly the point. We all know that. Our problem isn't that we don't know that we should trust in Jesus. I grew up singing the song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, or Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I know that. We all know that. I know that, and yet I still have a problem with those dang waves in my life. As hard as I try, I get distracted. I get worried. I watch the news and it's almost overwhelming sometimes like this past week. I don't have a bit of trouble finding things to be worried about. And I know that I should take those worries and lay them all at Jesus' feet and just trust. But it's not that easy. And having someone telling me that I just need to try and do a better job at it, isn't necessarily that helpful either. I feel a little bit like a fifth grader named Jimmy who wasn't much of an athlete. He was kind of round and pudgy. He'd grown wider before he'd grown taller. And he was getting along pretty well in school, but he dreaded that spring all-class track meet where everybody had to participate. And Jimmy, for whatever reason, got placed in the 100-yard dash. The gun sounded and all the other runners took off in a flash and all crossed the finish line before little Jimmy even got 50 yards out. And from the bleachers there was Jimmy's mother who was trying to be encouraging and supportive, yelling out, run faster Jimmy, run faster. Now poor Jimmy was running just about as fast as he could. And those words from mom weren't particularly helpful at all. <laughs> Someone telling me that I just need to trust in Jesus more and try to do better just isn't real helpful when I'm trying about as hard as I can already. You ever feel that way? <laughs> Please say yes. Okay. I think sometimes we confuse the gospel with good advice. Advice or the law lays out there for us demands that we can never meet. So... Let's take another look at the story. And instead of seeing what Peter does and then doesn't do, and then try not to make the same mistakes, let's really look at Jesus. What does he do when Peter's focus fails and when Peter begins to sink? Verse 31 says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. Jesus immediately reached out his hand. We all know that Peter should have kept his eyes on Jesus. We all should. But the grace in this story is that when we don't, when we try and fail, when we try to run faster but can't, 
Jesus will be there to grab us, to catch us, to put us on our feet again, and to give us another shot. And that's what a Savior does. That's what God, I am, wants you to know through the life and the ministry of Jesus. There is someone there to catch you if you have the courage to let go, try and do it all yourself, and the faith to begin again. Jesus isn't just a guide for us or a life coach. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the one who does for us what we can't do for ourselves. If we forget that when we share the gospel, then good news isn't much different than a self-help recipe that you might hear on Oprah. Jesus says, take heart, I am. Do not be afraid. I believe Jesus wants to do more than just catch our attention. Do more than just tell us, focus on me. Jesus wants to save our lives. And that's exactly what he's promised to do. That's why we call him our Savior. No matter what waves or storms have taken your attention this past week, come to this table and know that the Lord promises to grab you from the waves and set you free. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for being there for us, for your people to reach out, to lift us up, to grab hold of us, that you are that strong arm of salvation for us. Thank you for the grace and the love that you poured out for us in Jesus Christ our Lord.